Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the auditorium at Calvary Road Baptist Church on this hotter than blue blazes day. Glad you're here. I hope you've stayed hydrated all day long. Make sure you hydrate your animals. I'm talking, of course, of your children. We are in the uh, People's Republic of California, the gulag known as Los Angeles County, the city of Monrovia. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness. Appreciate the opportunity to gather midweek for a consideration of your word. We ask that you might bless us, that you might graciously give to us what we need in order to live for you, love you, and serve you effectively from day to day. Uh, please help us illuminate our understanding by your precious Holy Spirit, and we will for that thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, I'm going to bring to you the second part of an examination of John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Before we take up where we left off last time, it would be good for us to read the passage together. So I invite you to turn to John chapter 15, and we'll read it, and then I'll summarize for those of you who were not here when I first visited the text. When you find the passage in your Bible or on your app, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. The Lord Jesus Christ said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He's speaking, of course, to the eleven remaining apostles. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Won't you please be seated? I previously drew a contrast between the concept of love as it is imagined by unsaved people in this world who are utterly cut off from spiritual reality and love as it is shown in God's word. The way the unsaved of this world envision love is to imagine that it sanctions the unbridled and unrestrained pursuit of personal pleasure. No boundaries, no limitations, and certainly no judgment of others regardless of their conduct. Sadly, many professing believers approach this matter of love without any noticeable change in values or practices from their former profession. And if that is the case with you, this will be a wonderful opportunity for God to bless you with new insights and opportunity for service. To illustrate the position and the practice of the unregenerate, this is how a young couple will justify their willingness to fornicate. The same justification is used by same-sex couples to justify their sexual misconduct. They imagine, they imagine that their personal pleasure apart from the sanctity of marriage is acceptable so long as they claim to love one another and feel oozy and gushy toward one another. That makes it okay, they think. Setting aside my personal affection and love for those enslaved by such sinful confusion, it is necessary to point out that quite apart from anyone's desire to self-authenticate his or her actions or motives, there is the matter of rightness and wrongness that is completely up to God. Amen? The rightness or the wrongness of anything and everything is completely up to God. Call whatever you are doing love all you want, 
But if it involves sexual activity outside the boundaries of marriage as set forth in the Bible, it is sin and cannot be love. God, who is love, has the sole prerogative to show his creatures what real love is and how it is to be expressed. I illustrate from a comment the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 13 and verse 5 specifically, which is known to many Christians as the love chapter, that is chapter 13. But notice what the Apostle Paul wrote in verse 5. He wrote that charity, agape love, doth not behave itself unseemly. To refresh your memory, that phrase is found in the middle of the Apostle's inspired description of the expressions of love people are to display for one another. The Greek word translated behave unseemly, eskemeneo, refers to behaving disgracefully, refers to behaving dishonorably, refers to behaving indecently. In other words, genuine love will not do certain things. And it's not related to feelings, okay? It's not feelings. Genuine love is restrained in its expressions to deeds that are honorable, honorable both toward God and toward other people. Remember as well, I pointed out that not only is the love one has for another human being demanding, but also the love one has for God is demanding. How can this be seen? It can be seen in the insistence that both God and the Savior have be expressed by obedience to God and the Savior. The way you show your love for God is by obeying Him. The way you show your love for the Savior is by obeying Him. Not saying, oh, I love Jesus, oh, I love Jesus, oh, I love Jesus. Anybody can say that. And they can actually mean that while being wrong about what that really is. The apostle attested to this some 50 years later in 2 John verse 6, where he wrote, And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Real love is expressed by obedience. If what you call love is not demanding, therefore, it isn't love at all. Rather, it is a perversion of love. It is a delusion about love. It is a distortion of love that reflects the nature of God who is love. So if it's going to be real love, it has to reflect the nature of God and not a distortion, not a perversion, not sinful. So having dealt with verses 12 through 15 last time, let us take up this evening, I hope I can get through it, verse 16 of John chapter 15. Jesus said, "Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. We will examine this phrase or this verse a phrase at a time. I was going to say we're going to examine this phrase a verse at a time, but no, it's actually we're going to examine this verse a phrase at a time. I hope to get through the first phrase. That would be nice. The first phrase, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. We recognize that the whole of this chapter is steeped in love, is concerned with those who love, shows some of the responsibilities of love, and shows the context in which one's status is changed from being a servant of Christ to being a friend of Christ because of love. It is in this context we find our verse. In first century Palestine, it was common for disciples to attach themselves to a particular rabbi for instruction. 
the rabbi didn't attach himself to them. They attached themselves to the rabbi. The rabbi did not seek them out. They sought the rabbi out. In all likelihood, Saul of Tarsus in this way became a student of Gamaliel. However, the Savior demonstrate that he was, demonstrates that he was not tradition-bound by emphatically stating that such was not the case with the relationship he established with his men. He did nothing the way the rabbis did. Ye have not chosen me. With every other rabbi, the disciples chose the rabbi. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, it was he chose the disciples. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Consider three implications of our Lord's statement, reminding ourselves once more that the statement was uttered in the context of love. First, the Lord Jesus Christ chooses his disciples. That is a crucial fact to recognize. The implications are enormous. Three things to notice in this regard. First, notice the timing of his choosing his disciples. Three years earlier, at the beginning of his earthly ministry, which began when he was baptized by John the Baptist at the south end of the Jordan River, the opposite end of the Jordan River from where they do all the baptizing today, the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days. When he returned from his wilderness temptations, he was pointed out by John the Baptist to Andrew and John, who then recruited their brothers. Sometime later, the Lord Jesus Christ returned to Galilee for the first time since the beginning of his public ministry and went to the city of Capernaum. Those he had called to be his first disciples, he called once more, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. The third calling of the first of Christ's disciples is found in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Yes, he actually called them three times. Oftentimes when people study these three passages, they think they're just, dis just different descriptions of the same event. They are not different descriptions of the same event. They are descriptions of three separate events. However, these three events in the lives of the earliest of Christ's disciples are not records of the Lord Jesus Christ choosing them. They are the historical records of him informing them that they had been chosen to follow him. The times when he communicated to them his decision that they were to be his disciples. What is crucial to us is the timing of Christ's decision to make those men, or for anyone else for that matter, to be his disciple. We're interested in the timing of the decision. He clearly stated that he does the choosing. The question for us to ask is, when does the Lord Jesus Christ do the choosing? And remember what I always say, you're unlikely to find the right answers unless you ask the right questions. And so many people these days, they don't want to know the answer to that question. They, they really don't. Perhaps we can best answer this question by searching out when God the Father made his choice. What do you think? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 speaks of God's choosing, God the Father's choosing. Paul wrote, according as he, God the Father, chose us in him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 also speaks of God the Father's choosing. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 reminds Timothy of the timing of God's purpose to save and to call us. Paul wrote, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Before the world began. Since the Lord Jesus said, I and my Father are one, and he did say that, and since he also said, I do always those things that please him, and he did say that, and since believers are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the Bible does say that, which takes place in eternity past, is it conceivable that the timing of Christ's choosing does not coincide, coincide with the timing of the Father's choosing? I don't think so. You could write a book about it, but I don't think so. The Father and the Son did their choosing at the same time. Thus, while Christ's choice was made known during the course of the chosen person's lifetime, the time when Christ actually did the choosing was eternity past. Some would argue with Christ's decision that it was contingent upon each individual's act of will, but I find no support of that in God's will. Next, notice the basis of Christ's choosing of his disciples, which will reinforce this first point that I've made. If Christ's choosing took place in eternity past, on what basis must his choice have been made? That is to say, why did he choose as he did? It could not have been made on the basis of anyone's good works or any kind of merit since it was long before anyone existed. This is consistent with what the Bible teaches about salvation being by grace through faith and not of works lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 which reads... For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As well, let us not forget Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our best deeds are nasty in God's sight, and we are therefore incapable of meriting salvation. We are incapable of deserving salvation and a place in heaven. Therefore, while the Lord Jesus Christ must have reasons for his choice, since he is not arbitrary, since he is not capricious, his reasons for choosing who he chooses are unknown to us, except for the certainty that the reasons do not lie in us. Are you a Christian? His reason for choosing you does not lie in you. His reason for choosing me certainly doesn't lie in me. Therefore, since salvation is by grace, and since the choices the Lord Jesus made took place in eternity past, there can be no possible argument that anyone whose sins are forgiven in any way deserves so wonderful a gift from God as Jesus Christ for a Savior. The timing of Christ choosing is eternity past. The basis of Christ's choosing is purely a matter of God's grace, his completely unmerited and to us undeserved favor. Third, Notice the necessity of his choosing. I do not suggest here that Jesus Christ has to save anyone, since that would be a contradiction of salvation by grace. The Lord Jesus fulfills no obligation by saving sinners. What I'm asserting is that if Jesus Christ chooses to save any sinner graciously, of necessity it must be he who chooses who he will save. You say, why is that? There are two irrefutable reasons why my Lord Jesus must choose who he will save if he chooses to save. 
First, Jesus Christ has to choose because no sinner will choose Jesus Christ himself unless he has been influenced by God. Romans chapter 10, or chapter 3 rather, verses 10 through 12, explains why this must be so. Let me read it to you. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. It's a good thing to trust Jesus, but there is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's interesting. Isaiah's prediction from centuries earlier is fulfilled in each unaffected sinner's life. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 reads, He, which is to say Jesus, is despised and rejected of men. The second reason why Jesus has to choose who he saves is because of every sinful man's inability. Inability. What spiritual accomplishment can a sinner who is dead in trespasses and sins actually perform? What can a dead dog do? Can a dead dog bark? No. <laughs> what can a dead man do? Can a dead man believe? He's dead. He's dead. Dead in trespasses and sins is how the lost are described in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Moreover, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul writes, For when we were yet without strength, asthenia is the Greek word, which means impotent. For when we were yet impotent, in, two time, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He not only died for ungodly people, but he died for them when they were completely without potency of any kind. Thus, unsaved people are spiritually powerless. I used to be a lifeguard. I used to save people's lives for a living, kept them from drowning. Okay? Let me just tell you something about being a lifeguard. I don't need your help, and I don't want your help. The only thing you can do is make my efforts more difficult to accomplish. So I actually would let people get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse till they got to the place, especially if it was a strapping guy, I would wait until the guy got so exhausted and was so close to drowning that he was like a wet noodle so I could get a hold of him and control him and deliver him to safety. Because while he's still fussing and still fighting and thinking that he can, he can handle himself, he's just getting in the way. And I suggest to you that the same kind of thing is true with lost people. There are so many other passages reinforcing what we've seen here that even if sinful individuals would choose Christ, they could not choose Christ because of their spiritual deadness and impotence. So to sum up the spiritual reality, a sinner would not choose Christ if he could, and he could not choose Christ if he would. Therefore, for anyone to be saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ had to do the choosing from eternity past. However, the discovery of who Jesus Christ chose is revealed by who chooses Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to be clever. I'm pointing out that while God has revealed to no one who Jesus Christ chose before time began, Christ's selections are revealed by the eventual responses of elect sinners to the gospel message. So when we go out on visitation and we have different ministry and when we witness to people, you know what we're doing? We're, we're, our efforts are to discover those chosen before the foundation of the world using picture, picturesque language in which those Christ has chosen are described as sheep. Interesting, described as sheep before they're saved. Described as sheep before they're saved. Is that a bit of a giveaway? Described as sheep before they're saved. Jesus speaks to this matter in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep 
hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. So he's talking about people who were lost, who he then gives eternal life to. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Only those chosen before time are designated sheep by the Savior. Yet it is only when those who were chosen respond to the gospel, identified in this passage as his voice, that eternal life is given and public knowledge that they are Christ's sheep is established. First, they know that they're his sheep, and then others know that they're his sheep. Now, allow me to elaborate on how what is termed conversion takes place in, in four ways. First, it takes place by means of God's word. No sinner becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. No sinner's sins are forgiven. There is no possible way a lost person can come to faith in Jesus Christ apart from the ministry of God's word. This is irrefutably established in the epistle written by James, the first of the New Testament books to be written. James chapter 1 and verse 18, where he writes, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Thus, for the new birth to, to occur, for sinners to turn from their sins and turn to Christ in faith believing, the word of God has to somehow be involved. There is no salvation without some exposure to the sinner of some portion of God's word. Next, it takes place by means of gospel preaching. Jesus Christ commanded that the gospel be preached to every creature. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Sinners who properly respond to the presentation of the gospel by means of preaching are saved from their sins, such as both declared and recorded in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 17 and 18 is where we catch a glimpse of the importance of the means of spreading the gospel by preaching. Notice what Paul wrote. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul exhorted young Timothy in light of the importance and place of gospel preaching in God's plan. It reads, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Third, it takes place by means of the Spirit's wooing and regenerating. Though the Lord Jesus Christ announced that he chooses, and though it is clear that he paid the price on Calvary's cross and is thereby the only Savior of sinful men's souls, Scripture points out three indispensable roles the Holy Spirit plays in the salvation of every sinner. In his second letter to the Corinthian congregation, the Apostle Paul describes the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13 as the author of faith. He refers to him as the spirit of faith. Knowing that one's reconciliation to God is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's ministry therefore is understood to be vital to every aspect of a sinner's conversion to Christ. It was, it was to Nicodemus that the Lord Jesus spoke of the Spirit's role in the new birth, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, where Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. It would be to his disciples that our Lord spoke of the Spirit's work of wooing sinners in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11, showing sinners their need of Christ. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. Thus, the supernatural ministry of persuading sinners that they need the salvation that only Jesus Christ provides, providing the faith needed to trust Christ, as well as the miracle of the new birth that gives life to the spiritually dead sinner, corresponding to them placing their spirit-given faith in Christ, that is the indispensable work of the Holy Spirit of God. While the Lord Jesus, and only the Lord Jesus, must be looked to by the sinner as the object of saving faith, nothing happens without the cooperative involvement of the blessed Holy Spirit of God. Finally, by means of the convert's faith in Christ. When the man of God preaches the word of God and lifts up the Son of God in the gospel message, the Spirit of God applies the Word of God to the sinner's heart. Some of those who hear respond in faith, believing by coming to Christ, by trusting Him, by embracing Him as the sufficient Savior of their souls. This happens when God gives the gift of faith to the sinner as he hears God's Word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 declares, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Of those sinners who hear God's word preached, those who were chosen in Christ Jesus before the world began will be born again by the Spirit of God and eventually come to Christ, thereby revealing that they are Christ's sheep now given eternal life. How wonderful it is when God brings together the word of God by means of the preaching of the gospel, the person of the blessed Holy Spirit, and faith in Jesus Christ as the only Savior of sinful men's souls to bring about the salvation of that person who God's Son chose before the foundation of the world. It is all done in love. And the result is a sinner now saved who will forever be a trophy of God's grace through Jesus Christ in love. My experience has been that there seem always to be those who cry out in protest to this, what you say violates man's free will. However, not only have I never met a believer who protested that he was saved from his sins against his will. Have you ever known anybody that protested God saving him from his sins against his will? I didn't want to be saved. I didn't want to have my sins forgiven, but God drugged me into the kingdom. I've never heard anybody make that claim. They talk about that about other people, but they never, ref they never talk about that about themselves. I'm sure someone will dredge up an anecdote of a person who tried to commit suicide by drowning himself, who objected to being rescued by a good Samaritan or a lifeguard. However, such does not apply to salvation, does it? Since unsaved sinners are already dead 
in their trespasses and sins. They're not trying to kill themselves. They're already dead. The fact of the matter is that Jesus Christ is sovereign God, the second person of the triune Godhead, who chose unworthy sinners to receive his gracious salvation and benefit from his precious shed blood eons before any sinner ever existed. Had the Son of God not made such choices, not one sinner would ever have turned from his or her sins to a welcoming Savior. Therefore, let no one protest by crying out, unfair, unfair, unfair. The word to use instead is grace, grace, or perhaps mercy, mercy. What the unsaved say is of no significance to me. What the believer says is of little significance to me. However, what the Word of God says should be decisive for each of us. In God's Word, Jesus Christ said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. If you are one of the elect, Jesus Christ has chosen you. If you are not one of the elect, Jesus Christ has not chosen you. You say, well, that's not fair. Do you read no history? There was no such thing as fair in the history of mankind until it was invented on the playing fields of Eton in Great Britain, and it was the result of racial pride. However, the only way sinners will ever know on this side of eternity if they were chosen by Jesus Christ is when they choose Jesus Christ by responding to the gospel message and turning from their sins to Jesus Christ in faith believing. If anyone within the sound of my voice is lost, I urge you to choose Jesus Christ now. We now turn to the phrase, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit. When we focused our attention on the first portion of John chapter 15 and verse 16, and the word translated chosen, we dealt with the Greek word eklegomai, eklegomai, which refers to selecting someone for something or something for one's self. The Lord Jesus Christ emphatically pointed out to his remaining apostles that he chose them and they did not choose him. The selections made by the Lord Jesus Christ were selections made in eternity past, but were selections no one knew anything about until those who had been selected responded to the gospel message. Thus, the way sinners discover that they have been chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ is when, in response to the gospel, they choose Christ. This phrase reveals a second glorious truth. The Lord Jesus Christ not only chose them, but he also ordained that they go and bring forth fruit. Thus, we see our Lord circling back to his conversation with these men to the allegory found in John chapter 15 verses 1 through 6 in which we in which he spoke of the true vine the husbandman the branches and the fruit I'd like for us to hover over this word ordained for a moment the word is a form of the Greek tithemi and ranges in meaning. It's got a broad range of meanings. It can, it, can, it can range from placing something in a particular location to depositing something somewhere to assigning a task to someone that would be laying a responsibility on them to changing someone's experience or condition. One suggests the possibility, one of, these, one of these ranges of meaning, suggests the possibility that the Lord Jesus was expressing a Semitic concept to his men, that is a Middle Eastern concept, similar to the expressions used in the Old Testament for God's appointment of Abraham 
as father of many nations. Genesis 17, verse 5, Romans chapter 4, verse 17. The ordination of the Levites, Numbers chapter 8, verse 10. And when Moses commissioned Joshua, Numbers chapter 27 and verse 18. So how are we to understand what the Lord Jesus Christ meant when he made this statement to his men? I suggest that we pay attention to how the Lord previously used the word and how the word is used elsewhere in the New Testament. That's the appropriate way to interpret. Look back, if you would, to John chapter 15 and verse 13, where the Lord Jesus uses the same Greek word there translated lay down. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. As well, in Acts chapter 13, verse 47, the word is translated have set. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the world, on the ends of the earth. Lastly, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, where the, where the Lord is translated putting, where the word is translated putting, it reads, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. People frequently feel that the initiative with respect to spiritual matters is with them. Like they're taking the initiative, that it's on them. However, the Lord Jesus Christ assured his followers that such is not the case. It was not they who chose him, as was normally the case when disciples attached themselves to a particular rabbi. Students the world over delight to seek out the teacher of their choice and attach themselves to him or her. But our Lord's disciples did not hold the initiative. I don't even like the phrase, I accepted Jesus. They say, why not? Because the Lord Jesus Christ described himself in this fashion. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It wasn't you who accepted him. It was God the Father who accepted you in Christ. The only place that word accepted is used in that way. I'm not saying that people who use that phrase are necessarily lost. I just don't like it very much because I think it sets up a wrong understanding in people's mind of what the dynamic is. God is the initiator. God is the one who proposes. God who takes the initiative. It's on God. On the contrary, it was the Savior who chose them. And not only did he choose them, but he also assigned to them their task. And what was their task? What is our task? It is twofold. First, we are to go. The first function of Christ's disciples then and now is that we are to be emissaries for Christ. The second function then and now is that we should bear fruit, verse 2. This is not a decision that you and I make, just as it was not a decision Christ's apostles made. Just as the Lord Jesus does the choosing, so does the Lord Jesus Christ do the ordaining. Are we to do nothing? Not at all. What we are to do is the obeying. Yeah, we're to do stuff. We're to do the obeying. What we do is the implementing of the Lord's will for our lives. What we do is go, and what we do is bear fruit. Third, in John chapter 15, verse 16, the phrase, and that your fruit should remain. This short phrase provides two issues for our consideration. First, in this phrase, is the word fruit a word used five times by our Lord in the first five verses of this chapter and six times in the first eight verses. Must be important. Fruit, 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 fruit. Obviously, the word fruit is central to our Lord's allegory of the true vine, the husbandman, and the branches, and the fruit produced by the branches that are pruned, as well as the fruit that is not produced by the branches that are removed entirely and burned. The question that needs to be asked is, what is the fruit to which our Lord refers in this allegory? 
Though it is generally understood that the most likely meaning of bearing fruit is bringing sinners to Christ, the fruit of new believers in Christ, our Lord is intentionally imprecise about what fruit is here. He leaves it to the New Testament epistles to further clarify what is meant by fruit, with spiritual fruit of some sort being his obvious design. The New Testament identifies a number of different types of spiritual fruit. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul identifies a type of spiritual fruit he labels the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Contrasted with the works of the flesh, which are evil deeds that are a natural outgrowth of a person's sinful nature, there are two things about the fruit of the Spirit, the supernatural outgrowth of a believer's indwelling by the Holy Spirit, that I want to point out to you for clarification. First, the fruit of the Spirit is singular, meaning that it is one thing. It is not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21 are listed plural types of sinful behavior. The, the fruit of the Spirit, on the other hand, is one thing, singular. There are not fruits of the Spirit, but fruit of the Spirit. That aggravates me almost as much as people who refer to the book of Revelations. There's no S in Revelation, okay? There are revelations, but the book is Revelation, singular. Next, while the works of the flesh are deeds that are, that are done, Paul writes, they which do such things, verse 21, the fruit of the Spirit is a single thing, again, fruit, not fruits, that is described from a series of different perspectives that provide for us a description of personality traits that comprise a believer's spirit-affected personality. I will go so far as to tell you that I think the fruit of the Spirit is the indwelling Spirit of God pushing His personality out into the life of the Christian that He is indwelling. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11 is where the apostle identifies another type of fruit that he refers to as the fruits of righteousness. Modern, translates, modern translations reflect their inferior Greek texts by translating this as fruit, singular, when it should be fruits, plural. Thus, Paul is referring to this verse, in this verse, to righteous deeds as the conduct that is produced by righteousness. Deeds that are the direct outgrowth of a righteous nature. In Hebrews 13, 15, we see that praising God is, a, is yet another spiritual fruit. The fruit of our lips expressing thanks to Him. By Him, therefore, let us offer the praise, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. And then there's Romans chapter 1, verse 13, and Romans chapter 15, verse 28, both describing the fruit of, wait for it, financial offerings given to advance the cause of Christ. This is referring to money. Romans 1, 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. In other words, I would like to collect offerings from you guys as well as the other churches that I've been to. And then in Romans chapter 15, verse 28, When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, in other words, once I've given them the money, I will come by you into Spain. Though many think these verses refer to souls brought to Christ, Paul specifically points out in Romans that he preached the gospel only in virgin territory where the gospel was not preached by others. 
So he wasn't doing any gospel preaching in and around Rome. Careful attention to context establishes the fruit in these two verses refers to giving monetary offerings. Giving money to the cause of Christ is, therefore, spiritual fruit. Thus, fruit in John chapter 15, verse 16, should be seen expansively to include souls brought to Christ, giving that is used to finance the spread of the gospel to reach souls for Christ. Thirdly, personality traits produced by the Spirit of God that, that, that is termed the fruit of the Spirit. Righteous deeds reflecting a new nature and expressions of praise and thanks given to God. Each of these five are properly recognized to be spiritual fruit that is produced by branches that abide in the true vine. But there is a second thing to notice in this phrase. The fruit they will bear is not transient, but will remain, with the word translated remain being the same Greek word for abiding, meno. Reflect on this, if you would, for just a moment. Fruit that remains is quite opposite from someone who makes a profession of faith in Christ, is baptized, serves God for a while, and then begins to cool down, back off, and become increasingly scarce. We're not talking about that here. That is not what is meant by fruit that remains or fruit that abides. Granted, every church will experience those who fall away. It's sad. I wish it were avoidable. Christ's allegory at the beginning of John chapter 15 includes just such a tragic type of occurrence with the removal of unproductive branches. But what about ministries that are characterized by large numbers of professions of faith, many baptisms, fervent activity for short periods of time, and then dramatic drop-offs of service and attendance as a characteristic of that church's ministry? Some describe it as having a very large front door whereby people come into the church, but also a very large back door with many of those who come also eventually going out. As applied to the individual who is a genuine Christian, <coughs> this also suggests that the various kinds of spiritual fruit will always be present in the Christian's life. Righteous deeds, faithful giving, verbal praise and thanksgiving, Christ-like personality, and involvement in bringing others to Christ will always, in varying degrees, be part of the real Christian's life. And finally, in John chapter 15, verse 16, the phrase, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. This is a portion of scripture that Charismatics and Pentecostals have twisted beyond recognition. And it's been my observation over the last 40 plus years of gospel ministry that almost everyone else in the Christian community has begun to follow suit in thinking that this phrase means what the name it and claim it people think it means or pretend it means in order to take advantage of donors. I don't think Kenneth Copeland really believes what he says it means. I don't think Creflo Dollar really believes what he says it means. I don't think Joel Osteen really believes that it means what he says it means. Uh, I don't think T.D. Jakes actually believes that it means what he says it means. Or Benny Hinn or you know, all the others. I think that they say that it means something so they can get people to give money to them. I may be wrong, but that's what I think. It's my opinion, privately held, publicly expressed. One of the principal features of sound biblical interpretation is to pay careful attention to the context in which a word or phrase is found, and also to withhold your final conclusion about what something means until you have considered it in light of what the rest of the Bible teaches. With that in mind, reflect with me on what the Lord Jesus said only moments before in John chapter 15, verse 7. 
He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Does this verse not give you the distinct impression that the Lord Jesus Christ is assuring his apostles that the guarantee of requests being granted is derived from those requests coming from someone who is abiding in Christ? With Christ's words also abiding in him? You cannot separate verses 16 and 17. Okay, those, ver those ver verse identifiers, those numbers, number 16, numbers, they're not inspired. Okay. Thus, there is no promise here of a Gulf Stream jet. There is no promise here of a mansion with a private airstrip near it for the asking. See, how do you know that? <laughs> well, think about it, folks. Someone who abides in Christ with Christ's words abiding in him would never ask for such things. Jesus owned the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth of every mine, but did he ever use it extravagantly? You've never known a spiritual Christian to ask for such things. That's not the way spiritual people pray. Add to that contextual consideration the fact that the verb is used by the Savior in the last phrase of John 15, verse 16, as a subjunctive form of the verb didomi, meaning the Lord's answer to the request is conditional upon the spiritual situation of the person doing the praying. As well, let us consider John 14, verse 13, which words the Lord spoke a bit earlier after leaving the upper room. He said, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Here we begin to see that to ask God for something in Jesus' name is akin to abiding in Christ and Christ's words abiding in you while asking. Then there is John 16, 23, John 16, 26, spoken just a few moments after the occasion of our text. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. Thus it is very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ's intent at the end of John chapter 15, verse 16, was not to provide a blanket guarantee for praying Christians to expect to get anything they want when they pray for it. It was a promise that the believer who abides in Christ, the child of God who approaches the Father and asks in Jesus' name, will certainly re receive what is desired because what is desired is God's will and because God rewards his children who abide in Christ and who ask in Jesus' name. Hereby is the Christian who seeks to, glor to, glor to glorify God informed instructed and encouraged in this matter of prayer. If there was one takeaway from John chapter 15 verses 12 through 15 that we looked at last time, it is that the reason love is demanding is because of loving commands. If there is one takeaway from John 15 verse 16 that we've looked at tonight, it is that the reason love is demanding is because of a loving choice made in eternity past proposed that the ones chosen would prayerfully bear fruit that remains. I'm out of time, obviously not finished with the passage, Lord willing, I'll wrap things up with John chapter 15, verse 17 next time. Father, thank you for your goodness. I pray your blessing upon this study. I know it's been a lot. Oh, Lord, I've set before folks a lot to consider, but I pray that it might be of benefit, that it might be edifying. Please bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.